Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. This year we decided to go through the entire book of Revelation as a Bible study, and we've now turned it into an online Bible study. We're doing it really slowly in little tiny small bite-sized chunks, maybe five minutes here, eight minutes, ten minutes. We're trying to make this simple, easy to digest, so that we can really cover everything, make it easy to understand, and hopefully uh, make it enjoyable to read. Uh, we just finished the letter to the church in Ephesus. We're in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 8. Um, Revelation, this beginning part, Jesus is dictating a letter to John, and John is going to send these letters to seven churches. Now we have four of the letters here in Revelation. Uh, letters to Ephesus, which we just read, Smyrna, Pergamum, and Thyatira. Verse 8 says, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, The words of the first and the last who died and who came back to life. Smyrna is a very dangerous place to live, especially right now uh, at the time that John is writing this letter because the Roman emperor Domitian is the guy in charge and he is not, he is not a fun guy. Um, Domitian had the title Dominus et Dues, which means Lord and God. That's how he wanted his constituents to refer to him. And in order to buy and sell in the Agora, a person had to first pay incense. They had to give tribute to the Caesar, which was a way of acknowledging that he was God. The shoppers then were given some sort of ink stain or mark that allowed them to enter the shopping center. And the early Christians refused to take the mark because that would imply that they agreed that the Roman emperor was Lord and God. And they used to refer to that mark as the mark of the beast. Domitian believed his destiny was to bring universal peace. He was going to bring salvation to the world. And to kind of reinforce that, he used to have 24 choir members around him and they would follow him down the streets and they would sing to him. They would sing, you are our Lord, our God, who deserve glory and honor and power. Domitian was an emperor who also brought back the Roman games. They had been away for a little bit and at his games, all of his priests would wear gold crowns and the crowns would have all of his titles of divinity. And in his games, Christians were often killed for sport in all kinds of ways, and it was very graphic and very bloody. Domitian would ha also have riders on horses that were stained with different colored powders that would come out and clean up all the corpses. Christians of this day and age had to live in hiding. And so if you were a Christian in Smyrna, or you were a church in Smyrna, you got to be very careful. You weren't very public. Verse 8 says, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and who came back to life. So Jesus starts off this letter by bringing them some comfort. Jesus announces himself to his readers like he does in all his letters. And to this church in Ephesus, to our first one, he said, I am the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. And it was a way of uh, reassuring his readers that, you know, I'm down there with you. I walk among you. I'm next to you. But to the church in Smyrna, his reassurance is, I'm the one who died and who came back to life. Why does Jesus describe himself this way? Probably because he's speaking to a group of people who very possibly could die. And he says, you know, I died. I died and I came back to life. But then as that little piece of encouragement, right, it's almost to imply that, you know, it, it, if it happens to you, right, you will live again. You will be with me in paradise. Jesus says in verse 9, I know your tribulation and your poverty. More comfort, right? More comfort from Jesus. Before he gets going and starts talking about the body of his letter, he says, hey, this letter is from Jesus. You know, I 
died, I was persecuted, I came back to life, and I see you. He says, I know what you're going through. You ever wondered if God knows what you're going through? You ever prayed that prayer where you ask God, hey, do you even see me down here? Do you see what's happening? Can you come down here and watch over me? Because I don't think you can see what's going on in my life. I've wondered that from time to time, right? If God's paying attention to you. Revelation chapter 2 is God saying, I'm aware. Jesus says in verse 9, I know your tribulation. And the word for tribulation there in the Greek is the same word that we would use for childbirth, really. So Jesus begins with comfort. He begins with reassurance. He says, I do see you. I see your pain. I see your physical pain. I know it's excruciating. I know that you are poor and some of you are homeless and you feel empty and you feel lost. But what does Jesus say? He says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are actually a synagogue of Satan. You know, there were Jews at that time exposing Christians. They would tell the Romans, they would cheat, they would narc on them, they would say, I know where the Christians are, and and they would point them out. They would say, here are the believers. You know, these are the people that you're looking for. And the Jewish people would turn in their own people. And so, as a way of protecting themselves and making themselves ingratiate with Rome, they used to betray their brothers and sisters and not even care that they were fellow Jews. Jesus says, I see you. I see that you're in pain. I see that you hurt. I see that you're wounded. I see that you're betrayed by your own people. And Jesus says, but you're wealthy. He says, you're rich. And I read this. So this letter in Smyrna about the pain and the woundedness they feel, the betrayal that they feel, that they are hunted, that they are persecuted by their own government, that they fear actual physical death. And Jesus tells them, I know you think you're poor, but you are rich. You know, I think sometimes we pray, God, just give me a little bit more, right? I don't need a lot. I don't need to be Bill Gates rich, but can you just help me out? Can you just give me a little bit more? I just want to be more comfortable, right? I just want to be able to afford a little extra. And I feel like God's telling us, what are you talking about? You are rich, right? I give you everything. Yes, we all walk through pain. We walk through brokenness. We sometimes walk through times of poverty. Many of us have experienced what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. I have. Many of us have been fired. I have. Uh, Been unemployed, been on unemployment. I have. Um, My wife and I slept on an air mattress in my mother-in-law's house. But, you know, in all of that, and even with everything that's going on in the world right now, I have never experienced persecution or fear like this church in Smyrna. Never. If anything, all those events in my life made me stronger, made me love God more, made me a better person. And when you see those people in your life that perhaps are wise Christians or mature Christians, and you think to yourself, I wonder how they got that way, right? I wonder what brought on that level of maturity or that level of trust in God. I bet you that the strength and the maturity that they show now came from some past hardship. It came from some past pain, some growth experience. That's where where muscles come from. Muscles come from pain. Spiritual muscles come from suffering. And Jesus says, I see you. He says that to you and me right now. I see you. I know you're broken. I know you're poor. I know you're hurting. But you know, I think you are some of the wealthiest people on earth. Man, it's so great to have those words, to have those reassurances from our Lord and Savior. They were true then and they are just as true today. Thanks guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.